Mary Magdalene had come to the disciples as an eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ. And when she came to them with this message, the scripture says they didn't believe her. Earlier, the women who had heard from the angels sitting in the tomb. You'll remember the angels said, Why seek ye him that liveth among the dead? And I am giving my own take on it. What's wrong with you? He's not here. He told you he would raise from the dead. Why seek ye him that liveth among the dead? And when they came to the eleven with this message, Luke's account says their words sing to them as idle tales. And they believed them not. We read in verse 14 of Mark chapter 16, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. We're going to consider that verse, Lord willing, next week. But we see the unbelief of the apostles. And what that lets me know is that no matter how reliable the testimony is, we will not believe unless God gives us the grace to believe. Don't think you would be, let me not think I would be any different than them. Faith is impossible for the natural man. Faith is the gift of God's grace. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, look once again in verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went out into the country. And this is what is known as the walk to the Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus. We read the details of it in Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read those because I think every believer just loves that passage of Scripture. I know they do. And when they had heard that he was alive, they were eyewitnesses. The Lord appeared to them physically. They didn't believe them. But let's look, go to Luke chapter 24 where we get a detailed look as to what took place at that time. I believe these two were a part of the 120 that met together in Acts chapter 1 and um, they were not a part of the 12, but they were certainly a part of the 120 disciples that were left after the Lord was raised from the dead. Now, in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, And behold, two of them went that same day, that Sunday, the day the Lord was raised from the dead, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, about seven miles away, a seven-mile walk, a leisurely walk that would take four, five hours, a fast walk. Somebody could cover it a lot quicker than that. But they were walking to Emmaus. Verse 14, and they talked together, of all these things which had happened. They talked about the Lord being crucified. They talked about hearing that he was raised from the dead. They weren't sure of it, but they heard that from the witnesses. And they were talking about these things, discussing these things. Verse 15, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now they didn't know who he was at this time. The scripture says their eyes were holden. and I know the Lord prevented them from knowing who he was. But I think at first, as they were walking, 
he walked close by silently, listening to what they were saying. But their eyes, verse 16, were holding that they should not know him. Now, the reason they didn't know him is because the Lord prevented them from knowing him. He was the one holding their eyes so that they did not recognize him at this time. And now the Lord speaks up and he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? He could see these men were devastated over what took place. They didn't understand what took place and they were very sad. And the Lord acknowledges that as he uh, interjects his words at this time. Verse 18, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And you know, I can't help but think the Lord probably smiled when he heard him say that. He knew exactly what had taken place. And he heard what they were saying, and they say this to him, and I can just see him smiling at that time. And he said unto them, what things? Well, he knew what things, but he's going to have them say. And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now, there's only one problem with that statement. Did you catch that? Was. He is. He is. He is the eternal I am that I am. So what they said did not measure up to the excellency and the glory of this one whom they were walking with. They didn't know. We thought he was a prophet, mighty indeed, and in word before God and the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Now, once again, what they said was partially right, but totally wrong. Who delivered him? Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now these men were used by God to fulfill his purpose. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? They were half right and totally wrong. It was God who delivered him up to this. Verse 21, but we trusted. Evidently our trust was misplaced. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Now, they were looking for a political kingdom. They thought, we thought he would bring us back into power. And even when the Lord ascended back into glory, the disciples were thinking things of that nature. And they thought, we thought he was going to redeem Israel and bring it back to its place of glory. And don't think of redemption in that light. That we're getting a better place. Every time we use the word redemption, it ought to be with awe and it ought to be with rever reverence. His mighty redemption of his people. But they were still confused. But you know, the Lord graciously comes to them, doesn't he? Aren't you thankful for that? He graciously comes to these two um, confused, I don't know what else to say, disciples. But we trusted that it he which had have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today's the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished 
When we were early, when, which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came saying that he had also been seen by a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Now, should they have been astonished by this? Should they have been? How many times did the Lord tell them, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be raised from the dead? Numerous. As a matter of fact, that very last night he told them this was going to take place, but somehow it didn't register. How many times has divine truth just not registered with me? Simple, I just don't see. They just did not see. Now here is the title of the message. Then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now the Lord loves these people he's speaking to. They were his children. They were believers. And yet at this time, he addresses them as fools and slow of heart to believe. Unbelief is the greatest sin. It is the mother of all other sins. And unbelief in a believer, we understand it, we still have a sinful nature, but that doesn't make it any less evil. I know that if I said to you, I'm guilty of a great sin. Everybody would be tingling, wondering what is it that he's done. And if I said, I'm guilty of unbelief, you'd, you'd be relieved. Well, I'm glad it's that, not something really bad. That demonstrates how ignorant we are with regard to this thing of unbelief. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What were they slow to believe? All that the prophets had spoken. And notice he said slow of heart. He didn't say slow of mind. This is not talking about IQ, but they were slow of heart to believe all things which were spoken by the prophets. What am I required to believe? All things that are spoken by the prophets. You know, one of the reasons I um, have such a disdain for these church uh, uh, documents that try to explain everything we believe, they'll spend 300 pages telling you what they think the Bible says, and. And then they'll say, you say, why do you do that? Well, the Bible's a big book. We need, we need an abbreviation, an abbreviated, concise statement with regard to what we believe. The Bible's only got one message. That's not complicated. Now, it's awesome, it's glorious, but there's only one message in the scriptures. And this thought of having these uh, documents and confessions and so on, Man, uh, trying to take the place of the Bible, that's wrong as it can be. I don't care what anybody says, that is just wrong. We have the Word of God. We do not need anything else. Now, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. The Lord said in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. And if I thought what they thought, I'd probably need a confession too. But he wipes all that away when he says, they are they which testify of me. Every scripture testifies of him. Now look what he says in verse 26. Ought not Christ, and that word ought is was it not necessary? 
Was it not necessary? That's the word. Was it not necessary for Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now, why was it necessary for him to suffer these things? And you know, I, I love the way the scripture, every time it talks about the sufferings of Christ, it's actually very understated. It doesn't go into great detail of the physical sufferings of Christ. I've heard preachers go into great detail as to what took place. And I wouldn't in any way dismiss the importance of what took place. But if we put just emphasis on the physical sufferings, we're missing what took place. The scriptures are so understated. He was crucified. That's the scriptural testimony. He was crucified. We get into all these different uh, descriptions of it. And, and I've, he was crucified. And the Lord said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now, why was it necessary for him to suffer these things. And why was it necessary for him to enter into his glory? The answer is real simple. The Bible said he would. The Bible said he would. Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we're healed. The Bible said he would. It was necessary because this is God's eternal purpose. Revelation 13 8 calls him the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And God, I love saying this, God made the universe for this to take place. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was necessary because it was God's eternal purpose for him to suffer and accomplish salvation for his people. And thirdly, it was necessary because the justice of God demanded it. Please hear this carefully. When Christ was on the cross, it was not the innocent being put to death. God said, I will by no means clear the guilty the sins of God's elect became his sins. Now I have to say that he didn't ever commit a sin. Even when he was made sin, he never committed a sin. Well, what was he? He was made sin. And he was made guilty. And when he was dying on Calvary's tree, it was not the innocent being punished. My sin became his sin so that he became guilty of the commission of my sin and the justice and wrath of God slew him because he's guilty. God said, I'll by no means. Listen to that, Exodus 34, I think it's verse 6 or 7. I will by no means, under no circumstance whatsoever, will I ever clear the guilty. And Christ was guilty. And it was necessary for him to enter glory because sin was paid for. Because justice was satisfied. Justification was accomplished. And it was demanded that he enter into glory. Because he fully glorified the Father. He finished the work the Father gave him to do. He said in John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. That's over. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Every single one of the elect were saved. Their sins put away. He must enter into his glory. And then verse 27, and beginning at Moses, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them. Now that word expounded, every other place it's used in the scripture, it's translated interpreted. Now here is the key to interpreting the scriptures. Now what's meant by that word interpretation? Simply this, here's how you know what they mean. Here's how you know what they mean. Now look what he said. 
and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, how long did this message last? I don't know, but wouldn't you have loved to heard it? Um, I doubt that they were thinking, boy, he's going off along. Uh, what a message this must have been. He began with Moses. I am the promised seed that will crush the serpent's head. I am Abel's more excellent sacrifice that actually made Abel righteous to where the God of glory actually respected him. Now something must be infinitely glorious for God to respect it. And the scripture says God respected Abel and his offering. That's what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does. He said, I'm that ark. Everybody in me saved. Everybody outside of me is judged. I am the blessing of Abraham to all nations. I'm Melchizedek. I brought the bread and the wine. I'm the greater that blessed Abraham, the lesser. I am the lamb of God's providing. God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. I'm that lamb. I am the man who wrestled with Jacob. And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. He had to have the blessing of this man. I am the one that Joseph's life typifies. Every event, everything that took place, I meant. You meant it for evil, he said to his brothers, but God meant it for good. What a statement with regard to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I am the one who spoke to Moses from the burning bush. I am the Passover lamb. It was my blood of whom God said, when I see the blood, he's talking about the blood of his son. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I am the tabernacle in the wilderness. That badger skin represented my flesh that covered up the Shekinah glory and presence of God. I am the great high priest with the names of the children of Israel engraven on my breast. And I'm the scapegoat on the day of atonement when the high priest put his hands on the goat. Sin was transferred. I am the scapegoat. I'm the brazen serpent. Everybody that looked to me who was bitten lived. I am the prophet like unto Moses. I'm the scarlet line in the window that saved Rahab and all of her family. That's me. I am the captain of the Lord of hosts that appeared to Joshua. I'm that angel that appeared to Manoah and his wife. I am Samson who saved Israel by his death. Remember that? He went into the temple and more people were killed by his death than by his life and he delivered all of Israel. I am the kinsman redeemer through whom David came. I'm David's Lord. I'm David's son. I'm the one who killed Goliath. To picture that I am the victor. Salvation comes because of what I did. All of Israel is saved because of what I did by myself. I am Solomon, the builder of the temple. I am the speaker in all the Psalms. Every Psalm you read, it's Christ speaking first. I am the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes. I am the lover in the Song of Solomon. I am the subject of the prophets. To him give all 
the prophet's witness. I am the Lord high and lifted up that Isaiah saw. I am Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. That's my righteousness. I am the one who gives the new heart. Now, I don't know how long this message lasted, but I'm sure they were just astounded as they listened to the Lord make the scriptures known to them. Now, to fail to see Christ in any scripture is to miss its meaning altogether. That's so, isn't it? I love what Paul said. I've determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't care what scripture it is. If it doesn't end up with Jesus Christ and him crucified, you've missed it. Somebody says, what about, what about nothing? That's why Paul said, I've determined not to know anything among you. Not to even esteem it as important. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And as they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, he made as though he would have gone further. Now, he didn't intend to go further. He was in control of this. But he is going to treat them in such a way as they're going to ask him to stay. They're going to ask him to stay. What did they do? But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Oh, how they were astounded by everything he had said, and they loved everything he said. Now, this is interesting. They didn't yet know he was the Lord, but they loved everything he said. Their hearts were burning as he was opening to them the scriptures and they loved the message <clears throat> they were hearing verse 30 and it came to pass as he sat at meet with them something strange happened the guest became the host he came to eat with them but who's the one doing the serving? And this is the same language used with regard to the Lord's table. The same language. You know, see, in our relationship with the Lord, he's always the host. He's always the giver. We are the receivers. You know, when the Lord said it's more blessed to give than to receive, he's the more blessed. He is the giver. All we are is receivers. So the guest becomes the host. And the scripture says, And it came to pass, verse 30, As he said at me with them, he took bread and blessed it, and break it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. All of a sudden they see, This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been with us all this time. He's been making known to us the scriptures. Their eyes were opened. Now understand this. Me and you are not going to understand the scriptures unless he opens our eyes. Look in verse 44 of this same chapter. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. I love the simplicity of this. You know when you're going to understand the scriptures? When he opens your understanding. You know why I'm going to understand the scriptures? When he opens my understanding. What a blessed thing when he opens our eyes and we see who he is. Is. Now understand this about saving faith. The most outstanding thing about saving faith is you know who he is. That, that's the chief thing. Knowing who he 
he is. You know, the thief, he knew who he was, didn't he? Lord, remember me. He knew he was the Lord. That's what saving faith is. It's knowing who he is. Everything comes out of that. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Now, when their eyes were opened, they knew him. I love the scripture. This is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And he vanished out of their sight, verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. What a good heartburn when he opens the scriptures. Isn't it? There isn't anything that is on this earth that is good as this. Him opening the scriptures. Oh, the Bible, God's holy word that testifies of him. Did not our hearts burn within us? When he shows us his beauty, heartburn. When he shows us the glory of his attributes, heartburn. When he shows us the glory of the accomplishments of the cross and how we're complete in him and how all sin is put away and that I stand before God justified without sin, without guilt, perfect in Christ Jesus, heartburn. When he shows me that I'm accepted, I'm accepted, I'm accepted in the beloved heartburn you know if, I, if he accepts me I, I don't care if no man accepts me do you really if you're accepted by him what else do you care about when he lets us know it is finished when he shows us himself heartburn this book is a closed book until he opens it up and when he opens it up, just like these men said, how did our hearts burn within us? Verse 33, and they rose up the same hour. Now, as soon, now remember, they'd been walking seven miles with the Lord. And they'd sat down and the Lord had preached to them and opened it into the scriptures. But as soon as he vanished, you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to get back to Jerusalem, didn't they? And I bet this seven-mile walk, I, I dare say it didn't take them very long. I bet they got there very quick. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Now, I don't really know what this is referring to because it doesn't appear to me to be Simon at this time, Simon Peter, because he did appear to him later. Maybe the other guy's name was Simon and this was Cleopas talking. It might have been Simon Peter or it might have been some other Simon. I don't know, but he appeared and here's what they did and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And what is amazing, and it's not really amazing, it's not really amazing, when they came with this glorious message, Mark tells us they didn't believe him. <laughs> they didn't believe. In 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 17. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped. And some doubted. They saw him and worshiped. And some doubted. Do you know the pronoun some is not in the original? And I've asked several people to make that no Greek. I don't. I, I can get through with helps, but I've called a few people to find out. And they said, "No, it's not there. It's not there." They saw, they worshipped, and they doubted. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That's always there. So, am I hard on these fellas? No, because I would have been one of them too. You don't believe until he makes himself known to you. That is when you believe, when he makes himself known through his word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that you would be to us what you were to those two men. Lord, we're dull and slow of heart to believe. And Lord, we know that's wrong. We know that's sinful. But we ask that you would exercise with us the pity and patience and revelation you had with them so that we might know thee. Reveal yourself to us through your word. And Lord, give us this heartburn that only you can give. Bless these words for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen.